greatest adventure would soon be won. I'm not going to make it to the moon. Just at the critical time when I could have been standing at the head of the line to go to the moon, my adrenal cortex, but my adrenal glands stopped functioning, and I knew that that would uh, uh, that would just knock me out of the running medically. When you've had that idea in your head for 15 years, it doesn't go away right away. Gene remained with the lunar program as one of its chief scientists. His dream of doing geology on the moon came true vicariously. His friend and protege, Dr. Jack Schmidt, flew aboard Apollo 17. As Gene watched, his theories about the effects of impact on the moon were confirmed live on TV. Every rock you looked at, you pick up a, a rock or look at a, at a large boulder and there's a little pit uh, there that's caused by a micrometeor impact. It became clear that the dominant geological process on the moon was, was meteor and cometary impact. Yeah, if I go down there, that thing's about 15 feet deep. I was immensely pleased and proud of Jack, but of course I was wistful too. I couldn't help feeling that there, but for that failed adrenal gland, go on. When we're getting in your bag, you're... God. I used to have dreams that I, that I got there, you know? <laughs> I got to the moon. I was there doing geology, even after, you know, for a long time. I had to go do other things. His feet would never leave the ground, but Gene was intent on making his own way into space. He'd found the scars of impacts that happened in the distant past. Now, he'd be one of the very first to find out if there were bullets out there that might strike the Earth in the future. It was an obscure, lonesome effort and involved frequent night-long drives to an observatory far from home. But in time, Gene found a new collaborator and companion for the road, a housewife who decided she too would become an astronomer. For Jean, it was a journey from deep disappointment to new dreams and adventures. I had some real misgivings because I thought, this means that I'm going to go to Palomar and I'll have to stay awake all night long and observe because I'd never stayed awake all night in my life. It was kind of a surprise to me to discover that I really loved the observing. I could, if I was very busy, stay awake all night. In the early morning hours, the shoemakers would wend their way up Palomar Mountain, home to what was then the most powerful telescope in the world. The 200-inch hail was the temple of deep space astronomy. It was called the Big Eye and was not designed for observing asteroids. 
In fact, before Gene came along, no one here or anywhere else had ever systematically searched for asteroids that could hit the Earth. Down the slope from the big eye was a tiny telescope that was virtually unused. The little eye was just what Gene needed. This is kind of suited to our, our style and level of effort. We, <laughs> we call it our mom and pop operation, and that's basically the way we've done it. it turned out to be a perfect instrument for our purposes. Compared with the giant up the slope, the little eye did not look far, but it looked very wide. It was ideal for patrolling the inner solar system for stray bullets. Most astronomers saw the solar system as a harmonious arrangement of planets orbiting the sun. They paid little attention to the hundreds of thousands of asteroids, chunks of iron and rock left over from the formation of the major planets. Most of them orbit harmlessly between Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid belt. But if an asteroid veered out of its normal orbit into one that cuts across the path of the Earth, it would be anything but harmless. Most scientists believe that asteroids almost never became Earth crossers. Were the shoemakers searching for something that wasn't even there? The answer would not come easily. Asteroids look so small on film that Carolyn had to look for them with a microscope. Even then, they would be almost invisible amid the stars. But slowly they emerge from the dark, tiny dim blurs. Since they're so much closer to Earth than the stars, they seem to streak through the sky. In 1989, other astronomers captured the first ever close-up of an asteroid using a giant radar dish. This huge rock was more than a mile across. Later radar images showed even more ominous asteroids, mountains tumbling through space. Tutatus, a giant boulder doing 70,000 miles an hour, regularly cuts across the path of the Earth. 951 Gaspra, first of only two asteroids ever to be actually photographed, is as large as the island of Manhattan. The 243 Ida is more than twice as large. Like Gaspra, it isn't an Earth crosser. But if it were, it could blast a hole as wide as the state of Texas. Gene didn't make it to the moon, but together with Carolyn, he's discovered scores of new celestial bodies. Between them, they found hundreds of asteroids and dozens of comets and helped transform the map of the sky. The solar system would never again seem stable or predictable. The harmony of the planets turned into a threatening cacophony. What we've been able to show using this good old telescope right here and by concentrating on surveying a near region around the Earth, we've been able to show that the Earth revolves around the Sun in its own swarm.